Good evening. My name is Monica Cordova. And I'm Paul Vasquez. Welcome to Banana Slug News. This week we'll be covering everything from the campus budget crisis to the revolutions in the Middle East. So sit tight and stay tuned to Channel 28 for this glorious episode of BSN. It's midway through the quarter, and these are the stories that have the campus buzzing. Tonight on BSN, we'll cover the music scene in Santa Cruz, upcoming theater productions, the fate of American studies, and the situation in Egypt. But first, rumor has it that In-N-Out has their eyes on Santa Cruz, and students could not be happier. Here with more on this story is our own Paul Vasquez and Kanal Narayan. Santa Cruz, California. A paradise. Some would say a home away from home. An educational mecca. A destination for amusement. However, can Santa Cruz truly be called a California paradise without a truly California institution? I am of course speaking of In-N-Out Burger, a restaurant that has captured both the hearts and the stomachs of the student population. Well, UCSC, your dreams are about to come true. I'm Paul Vasquez with the story. In-N-Out Burger, founded in 1948, has become a staple in many Californians' diet. Since its founding, the popular burger chain has garnered a loyal fan base many of whom can be found among our student body. One of my favorite fast food places, like we go, when I was back at home in Cal um, Cupertino, we went like every other week, so like, one of my favorite places to go. <laughs> we love In-N-Out so In much. Uh, I think everyone from like SoCal here really likes it. <laughs> they all miss it. I love In-N-Out, I absolutely love it. Um, it's one of the best restaurants ever. So simple, but burgers, man, <laughs> burgers. In spite of the obvious support the franchise has at UCSC, and in and out remains absent from Santa Cruz County. However, this fact has not gone unnoticed. And it'd be very convenient if there was one in Santa Cruz for us students. Uh, it sucks. I mean, come on, the best burgers ever. McDonald's has nothing on this. Burger King has nothing on this. In and out. We are so tired of college nines food because it's always just the same burgers, pizza. What else do they have? Burritos. Every single day, three times a meal, and I can't take it anymore. So if there was an in and out I would be amazed. But if there was an in and out in Santa Cruz, would you ever eat at the College 910 Dining Hall? Probably not. Yeah, or either. But, I, but I wouldn't eat at in and out every day. It's just, it, would be, it would be nice to have one. These students may finally get their wish. In an email from Carl Van Fleet, Vice President of Planning and Development for in and out Van Fleet states, our real estate team has been looking at Santa Cruz County for some time, and we hope to be there in the not-too-distant future. in and out plans to build a location in Santa Cruz County, with Watsonville making a strong push for the franchise. Because of Santa Cruz's restrictive drive through policies, the Watsonville location, right off the one freeway next to the Red Roof Inn, seems likely. This would be an incredible improvement as the closest in and out now is 33 miles away in San Jose, over the treacherous 17. Whether in and out chooses a Watsonville or Santa Cruz location, students are justifiably excited about the possibility of an in and out in SC. Have you guys heard that there is a possibility of one opening no. in downtown Santa Cruz or Watsonville? No. Nope. No. <laughs> well, there is. <laughs> really? <laughs> How do you guys feel oh, that they're looking for a spot right now? Oh, awesome. Have you heard that um, Santa Cruz County could potentially get an in and out? I have now, and <laughs> this is awesome, and I'll go the first day it's open. We should take over borders, make a huge impact. <laughs> borders? <laughs> Why borders? I don't know. Yeah. Well, food's, food's, food's yeah. more important than books. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but if it was somewhere close, that'd kidding. be pretty awesome. Like, if it's close to campus, I think they'd have a lot of traffic going in. So I'm yeah. sure everybody would go. <laughs> yes, 10 student. I think we all would go. This is Paul Vasquez, signing off. And that's, that's what a hamburger's all about. Thank you, Paul, for that delicious story. You got it. Now for some news from our very own theater arts department, Mummified Deer has hit the main stage. Here with an inside look is Aubrey Goslin and Mered Hidalgo. Hi, I'm Aubrey Goslin, reporting for BSN. This quarter, UCSC will be hosting the performance of The Mummified Deer, a piece written by Luis Valdez, the creator of El Teatro Campesino, and other works such as The Zoot Suit and La Bamba. 
The play will be directed by his son, Kinan Valdez. So we've decided to sit down with two of the characters in the play, Katie Ventura and Sutton Arabi, to find out more. Can you give us some background about the play? A lot of it is has to do with roots and family and where you come from and just identity in general. So a lot of the play is just Mama Chu trying to f trying to come to terms with her actual Native American roots because for her being a Yaqui Native American meant that you were going to be exterminated. So she just pushes that aside and claims that she's Mexican. Can you tell us about your role in the performance? The play is called Mummified Deer, and then my character, Kaheme, is that mummified deer, um, metaphorically. The main character of the story is this matriarch figure, Mama Chu, and my character, Kaheme, is this sort of subconscious guardian angel. So my role in the play is Jesus Maria Flores. Um, she is also known as Mama Chu, and she is the matriarch of this family, um, this imaginary family that the audience is going to get to to see um, throughout the play, how this family is even created. How was it working with the director, Kenan Valdez? Kenan is a really good director. He's his father obviously wrote the play Mummified Deer and he wrote other pieces like Zoot Suit which was very empowering for Chicano culture and history. So he actually, Kinan, brought his father in to do a reading with us and we could answer or he could answer all our questions about our characters and so that was really cool just to get a background of the story and how his actual family history is tied into the play so that was really interesting too. So working with Kinan um, has definitely been a very um, fortunate experience. I feel very privileged as a student. Um, I was involved with the Teatro Campesino in the summer of 2010. All of that work in the summer uh, was definitely helping me springboard into this uh, project of Mummified Deer. Um, Kinan is definitely the, I think um, I could say the best person um, to direct this play. Um, not only does he have very respectable, respectful uh, manner of himself, but he has great, you know, gravitas about himself, and he's the son of the playwright. <laughs> what would you say to someone who's trying to get involved? How about people here on campus that aren't part of the arts? Is it something that they can do? Yeah, like I'm a marine biology major, so I didn't think that it would be like possible to get into a UCSC production, especially a main stage one. So that's been pretty cool. Finally, we asked the actors if they had anything to say to UCSC students. All students should come check it out because it's free for UCSC students, so there's no excuse. Please support this play. Um, definitely, we've been working hard, and we hope everybody comes out. Um, even if you're, if you're uh, passionate about, about dance, about writing, about multicultural issues, about colonization, um, this all like revolves around like politics, um, so I think there's no excuse for you not to come out. I think you'll definitely be attracted to this work of art some way or another. So. This has been Aubrey Gosselin reporting for BSN. Be sure to check out The Mummified Deer, playing at the main stage from February 25th to March 6th. I'll be sure to mark my calendar for opening night. What an excellent event it looks to be. Turning now to global news. The world has been captivated by the current events in Egypt. The nation has been rocked by a historic revolution, but also economic deterioration. We turn now to Simran Bellaria and Jake Smith for the latest. If you've turned on a TV, listened to the radio, picked up a newspaper, or even just gone to class, chances are you've heard about Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak's resignation after 18 days of Egyptian protests. Now, with a fresh start at a new democratic government, the challenge has just begun. Demonstrators have taken to the streets across Egypt in what has been called a day of anger. The 
The Egyptian military will replace the parliament and govern the people until elections can take place in six months, though plans have been set for elections and a constitutional committee to swiftly enact democratically approved constitution reforms. The recent turmoil in Egypt has crippled its economy. Work stoppages prompted by the strikes, temporary closing of the stock exchange, and zero revenue coming from tourism has resulted in Egypt's international requests for financial assistance. We asked UC Santa Cruz students about their thoughts regarding the situation. Do you think that they're going to be able to smoothly transition to democracy? Um, well, that depends. I mean, like, if, they're, if the people are kind of for it, you know, and they're, like, kind of open-minded. Not right away. Uh, stuff like that takes a long time. Uh, it took us quite a while before we were actually stable. We had to go through another civil war before we actually were, like, democratic and whatnot. It doesn't sound promising to me. I don't think so, because um, historically that usually doesn't happen. Um, but that's just kind of how human beings are. Okay. Although economic difficulties lie in Egypt's path to democracy, the Egyptian government is carrying on, requesting the U.S. and European Union to seize assets of Mubarak and his inner circle. So far, Germany, France, the U.K., and Switzerland have agreed to freeze these assets. Yeah. Do you feel like international powers like the U.S. should step in with financial aid? I'm sure the U.S. will, but even though they probably don't want us to, they probably don't want us there, um, but... I'm sure we'll probably end up helping some way or another with money. I mean, we gave like $1.3 billion to Mexico for drug wars, so I'm sure we would give something. The WTO should do it. Uh, the World Trade Organizations, the IMFs, uh, all of the um, Bretton Woods sort of institutions should be responsible for that and perpetuating democratic institutions. Rather I hesitate to say for the U.S. just because of our debt and... Um, and things like that, and I would think that offering money internationally would be better served towards disaster things like Haiti and things like that. Um, so, at least for the U.S., I think it would be the greatest thing. I don't think that lending anyone money is like going to be like the best solution. I think that like teaching them like our ways and how we've like come up and you know as a society, you know, like I think that way they'll like they'll do better, you know, because I don't know that one saying, but you know, like you teach someone how to fish, it's gonna like you know it's gonna feed them longer than if you just give them the fish, you know what I'm saying? So the actions and results of the Egyptian protests have also inspired several other nations' unhappy citizens to voice complaints against their governments. Among these nations are Yemen, Jordan, Algeria, Iran, and Bahrain. This has kind of incited a protesting climate across the Middle East. Um, what do you think about that? Is that good? Uh, I mean, uh, more disorder in the Middle East is not great. <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. Yeah. Yeah, um, more turmoil means more violence, more uh, anarchy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's an interesting question. Um, I heard that a lot of the protests, at least in Iran, I think it was in Egypt, were like young people and college students and things like that. And that, that makes me really hopeful that, you know, um, people have called our generation, you know, not making a whole ton of change and kind of lazy and complacent. And, you know, that makes me hopeful that more people will be inspired by this and more people our age will be more interested in, in taking more action in effective ways. I think that that's, uh, that's good, I mean, at least for, like, all the other democratic countries because then we're, we're going to have, like, better trade like agreements with everyone and, like, I think everything will go more smoothly if, like, all the other countries kind of go with uh, with this new atmosphere that, like, that, this, uh, that Egypt's brought now. That's a great thing. You know, um, we really need to, especially in the United States, kind of wake up to the fact that as, like, the youth and the and the college-educated um, social group of the society, we need to really speak out, you know. Uh, it's... It's awesome that it's happening in the Middle East. It should be happening in the West more as well. Mm -hmm. It has been a historical time for Egypt and seems that this revolutionary climate will carry on in nations across the Middle East. It is our hope that UCSC students will continue to stay informed. For Banana Slug News, I'm Simran Bellaria. As you can tell, this is a truly remarkable moment in history. And now for some current events.
Do you want to indulge in your guilty pleasures? The chocolate-themed winter formal is being hosted by College 9 and 10 on February 25th from 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Tickets are on sale now for $3. Don't wait. They're $5 at the door. Make sure you come to the most delicious experience of the year. Crown College will be presenting the third annual Social Fiction Conference on April 8th and 9th. Registration has begun for the conference, which will seek to understand how social justice is embedded in our society by examining the societies found in science fiction, gaming, and fantasy universes. Previous workshops of the conference have included Clash of the Pantheon, Religion in Battlestar Galactica, and X-Men, The Last Stand Against Racism and Sexism. Human Force 5, UCSC's oldest improv comedy team, is having a show tomorrow night, February 18th. The event will be held in the Porter Fireside Lounge at 8 p.m. Admission is free and laughs are guaranteed. On February 22nd, Stevenson College is hosting their monthly blood drive. If you've ever wanted to donate blood, they'll be accepting walk-in appointments all day. Remember, one pint of blood can save one life, so stop by the Stevenson Event Center from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Tuesday to donate. On March 1st, students will be gathering at the East Field to express their continued support for free education and to protest the ever-increasing fee hikes. The protest has been organized by one university together, known as OUT, who are dedicated to keeping your education public, not private. Students will be able to participate in an aerial photo project and to be part of a large discussion with fellow student activists. The event will take place from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This Sunday, come enjoy some live comedy at the Crow's Nest Restaurant. Enjoy fest a fresh sea breeze, great food, and an evening of laughter as three comics take the stage. Crow's Nest is located on 2218 East Cliff Drive. Everyone on campus, no matter how long they've been here, has dealt with or at least heard about the continuing budget crisis on campus. With costs rising and quality falling, how could they not? Ryan Anderson, Michael Greck, and Bryce Kish teamed up to show you how this latest round of cuts is affecting students. As a result of system-wide cutbacks, there have been rumors floating around the last several months about the UC possibly closing down certain departments here on campus. While budget cuts are nothing new, these latest rounds threaten the school more than ever before. This year, Governor Jerry Brown has proposed an additional $500 million budget cut to the entire UC system. UC Santa Cruz will see a loss of $31 million. In fact, past budget cuts have forced the school to cut 80 faculty positions and 110 quarters worth of teaching assistants. We've also seen them cut pensions for grounds and custodial workers, and most importantly, we've seen them cut back entire departments. Despite the 8% tuition hike last quarter and the 32% hike the year before that, students are still feeling a steep drop in the quality of their education. Um, the hours of the library used to be a lot more, used to be a lot longer, mm -hmm. and now they're shorter. And I think they um, proposed a referendum, is that what they're called, last <laughs> quarter, uh, so that we would pay more to get the library hours extended. Um, so add more to like student fees, which I thought was ridiculous because library mm -hmm. hours is something that should be available without us having to pay, you know, six dollars more each quarter to have that happen. It's definitely rough. I mean. If you, how are you supposed to think about going to higher education grad school when you're struggling just to pay for your BA, you know? Right. So it's, it's tough. It takes a toll on you. It's, it went up, what? Like, it's gone up a ridiculous amount. My brothers both went to school and now I'm paying nearly twice as much or, or a third as much, a third more than they were paying. It's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. But I think the real problem is that like, fees are increasing without anything showing, you know? Like, oh, we're going to cut back. 500 million dollar, I mean increased tuition again, but quality still get worse overall, like there's nothing to show for it, you know, so it, I think it's just kind of ridiculous, and it's demoralizing really, like, oh, I'm paying more, but I'm getting less, like if, I, if, if it was like a restaurant, I'd be pissed, I wouldn't go back. A lot of my residents are taking classes that they absolutely do not need for GEs or for anything, just because they need the credits to be full-time students, but Mm -hmm. They can't get into the classes that they actually need, so it's really surprising that it's that bad. It's always been like understaffed, like we don't have enough TA to teach a uh, class, even though teachers really want to teach a bigger class class. Raising class sizes, that would um, that just makes it harder to get in touch with your, your professors, you know. Um, they get swamped, you know, you have to go in during office hours and sometimes they're, they're swamped in there. Last year, UC Santa Cruz eliminated the entire community studies department and it looks like others will soon follow.
The American Studies Department, for example, has proposed to stop admitting students into the major as of July 1st. This was the first in a series of steps that eventually led to the elimination of the Community Studies Department. Even though the department itself is optimistic that it will reopen its doors after two years, it's difficult not to take into account the far-reaching effects of shrinking resources. With proposed cutbacks looming over UCSC, the school may be forced to make a 6% cut across all departments. More importantly, a possible cutback would include a severe diminishing of the Business and Administrative Services Division. These services include police, fire, environmental health and safety services, human resources, physical planning and construction, transportation and parking, and even grounds and custodial services. Many students feel that these rollbacks aren't happening in the right places. So we asked what they think should happen with what money is left. Speaking from the psych department, because that's all I really have experience with, I just wish that we had more TAs. Um, if you can't find it in the budget to take away from something else to give education, you know, maybe raise taxes, level it all out a little bit, because, you know, education can't just keep taking cuts. You can't have stupider people as you progress in the future. And, I mean, some of the other UC campuses, the libraries are open until 2 in the morning, and I sometimes need to rearrange my study schedule because the libraries only open until 11 or only open on this time of the weekend. And I think it's something that needs to be open 24-7 because that's probably the main representation of education. I don't know. For the first time, students are paying more for the cost of their education than the state. And because of this, we will continue to see a rise in cost of education with a corresponding decline in quality of education. For Banana Slug News, I'm Ryan Ann. Things are definitely looking bleak for the future of the campus. Luckily, our next story is a bit more cheerful. It certainly is, Monica. Santa Cruz is a thriving musical community with many production companies and independent music projects. This diverse clash of interests has helped develop new styles and genres of music within the community. Our very own Lloyd Alaban and Pierce Crosby took a look into what's happening with Santa Cruz music. Have you ever wondered about the importance of music within your life? How many times a day do you listen to music or even hear music? Music has grown to be a part of American life and undoubtedly the U.S. culture. Whether it's listening to your MP3 players or going to a three-day festival, there are thousands of ways to enjoy the existence of sound. Here in Santa Cruz specifically, the musical diversity is probably one of the greatest in the state. We have everything from classical music symphonies brought to you by the UC Santa Cruz Orchestra to renegade productions by Don't Panic and Arson. The genres available to the public is somewhat limitless, it seems. And so we asked students their thoughts about the beauty of music. It's just the way to express yourself, especially when we're, I don't know, you've got a huge workload. Um, for people who aren't in the music pro um, program, and it's just a kind of way to release yourself. And when you are part of the music program, it's a, it's a way to express yourself. It's so ingrained in us. Without music, uh, I don't know what I would do, really. <laughs> it's an escape, kind of, mm. but at the same time. I mean, it can be whatever you want it to be, which is why music is probably so great, because it's such an ambiguous thing. It, it gets a lot of different emotions out of people that nothing else really gets out of. Hmm. It's a vital part of life, I think. Um, you know, it's one of, it's a unique form of expression that, uh, yeah, I don't know, I, I just can't imagine living without it. Just by capturing a few students and picking their brains on their musical interests, we were introduced to an insane amount of diversity that exists here at UCSE and in the larger Santa Cruz community. So we pose the question whether or not the Santa Cruz local community has enough to offer the diversity of interests. I like, I like the Santa Cruz music scene just because you get to be exposed to a lot of artists that you wouldn't otherwise see. And I heard about a lot of music that I probably never would have heard of in my lifetime if I hadn't lived here. I think it's really genuine. I think it's, if, if, there, is an, uh, if there is a search for authenticity, it's, it's to be found here. Like, yeah. there's just... Um, you find a lot of musicians here that aren't playing music just for like fame or glory. You find them just for having a great time and just because it's what they love to do, which is awesome. Oh, it's nice. I like that people perform together, jam. It's cool. Since the Santa Cruz community offers such a diverse amount of interests, 
it is interesting to consider why so many students come to this unique musical community to study. David Goodman, a third year student here at UCSC, has been greatly influenced by music since the second grade. David originally came to the university to study computer engineering, but his musical passion quickly attached him to the underground music scene. So we asked David, how does he manage to balance his life, school and music, musician and student? Uh, I have really chaotic lifestyle because I have so many things, I, so many different passions and so many different um, uh, obligations. So I I work like 20 hours a week and then I'm a full-time student and I'm also in a really um, serious band. So we, we like practice at least once or twice a week and have a show once a week. So um, I really don't have any balance at all. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling in every way, but, um, but it's interesting. And I think, I think it's gonna enable me to do a lot more later in life if I'm able to like find a balance. Yeah, so I'm still working on that part of it. The essentiality of music in David's life was palpable, but why choose such a technical field of study and still pursue musical um, interest? It's it's really interesting because I find like a lot of similarities in like the curriculum from engineering and music because I'm I'm also doing a um, electronic music minor, um, and I mean a lot of the math is similar, and when you're talking about different terms like you know oscillations and. Uh, you know, high pass, low pass filters, all those things are used in electrical engineering, they're used in music. It's, they're really similar and um, I can see the connection between them and it's definitely going to benefit me like because engineering I'll, I'll know how to work with um, with hardware and things like that. I'll be able to design it, you know, nowadays instruments are digital and there's lots of MIDI out there and stuff like that so I'll be able to design interfaces like that and so yeah, they're intermingled. So you think like maybe Instead of I mean making the music, he'll be making the soundboards. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's one. That's one application. Yeah. There's so many though, like yeah. that haven't been thought of. You know. We asked David if it was definitely true that music was one of his true passions. Uh, <laughs> music's definitely one of my many passions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that. It's one of the top ones. Yeah. But um, I try to focus more on school and um, and spread my talent and my love to all my passions. You know. <laughs> So. What could be said about the local Santa Cruz music community? Santa Cruz offers a re yeah a great musical community. Um, I don't think it's as good as it could be. Um, you know, a lot of people are um, kind of lazy and stuff. Not in Santa Cruz in general, and just everywhere. But um, I see a lot of potential here, and there is a lot of um, there's a lot of talent, and there's um, a lot of shows going on, and musicians getting together, and um, yeah, just a lot of friendliness and stuff. It's a pretty good. And scene. with this great community comes great responsibility. I was also interested how music could continue to exist in David's life once he graduated. I have had this fear that I'll graduate and, and right now I really enjoy my, uh, my work, but I have this fear that I'll graduate and I'll get wrapped up in a corporate job somewhere because I've already had a lot of experience in um, internships in the corporate like areas and stuff like that. So um, I, I, can, I can adapt it really well. I'm kind of worried that I'll get sucked into it and lose my musical mo momentum, I guess you'd say. But um, um, I think I'm gonna try and make it a goal to stick with music as long as I can and put as much time into it as I, as I have, you know, outside of what I need to do to, to buy the instruments to make music, you know? Yeah. So. so yeah, gotta balance. Exactly, yeah. But I think I'll, I'll definitely keep with music for, till I die. Indeed. David is but one of many musical students here at UCSC following his dreams responsibly. For Banana Slug News, I'm Pierce Crosby saying rock steady, Santa Cruz. Well, it's good to know that some people can be full-time students and still balance all their other interests. Thanks, guys, for keeping us up to date. Well, that's it for this edition of Banana Slug News. Make sure to check out our website at www.slugtvnews.org for the most recent news around the campus or to see how you can stay current with BSN. If you would like to get involved as part of our group or have an important story that you feel needs to be reported, 
contact us, email us at bananaslugnews at gmail.com to see what we can do for you. For all of us at BSN, I'm Monica Cordova. And I'm Paul Vasquez. Good news and good, and good night. night.